great man. He's a, he's a fighter. Tony Nadi of the Lower Niger Congress. He's the Secretary General of the Lower Niger Congress. Like Pastor already said, the reason he asked me to come to join us uh, today in the midst of <laughs> so many other things waiting to be done is so that, and I'm going to plead with us, whatever we knew about this matter before, let us put it on one side of the table and listen with open mind. By the time we come to the end of the presentation, we probably will have a, a much different perspective from what we had before. And they are, all, they are not conjectures. The envelopes that have been uh, put in the hands of uh, a few of few, we incidentally we couldn't get enough of all the documents. There are five documents in them, in the envelopes. And uh, those documents, those documents go to the root of what the problem is, if we, if we can relate with those documents, it is within our reach to spread it around on such a scale that those who have been tormented in this union will receive a new life. Something will give way somewhere. We also have the, there are things that will come on screen the ones that are in other forms, not uh, easy to print like this. So we could see, because they are all verifiable things. By way of further introduction, yes, I'm a lawyer of 26 years with specialty in jurisprudence. And I've, uh, I've been on this uh, task for quite a while. I set out as a young man to be a military pilot, I should have been flying uh, jet fighters. I read all the physics and chemistry, mathematics of this work, I can still teach them. But by some providence, I ended up in law. And I didn't understand how, where that was going until in the final year when we took the course. Are there lawyers in this house? Any lawyers, please? It's a practical. And if you have your telephone, if you have your telephone with you and you have internet access, I will also encourage you to switch it on because we'll make some quick references to things you can verify. I want you to be able to go back to your station and, and, and confront whoever come to tell you any other thing. It doesn't matter what that person uh, uh, says he is on the matter, you know. We will go from like doctors will do diagnosis, prescription, and then the treatment. The reason why things have remained upside down here is that we've not gone to the right diagnosis. Some will say, oh, it's corruption. Far from it. You know how the Western world solve their problems? When they say, oh, it's corruption, somebody will ask, what is corruption? How did it come? Where is it coming from? Your body is hot. Somebody says it's malaria. Somebody was, what is malaria? You then find out it is mosquito that is responsible for it. They will go beyond that. Some of our people will just go and buy a net or buy a broom or something to stop mosquito for one moment. Anybody who wants to solve malaria goes all the way to stopping mosquito from breeding in the neighborhood. It's as simple as that. If you don't, the next mosquito comes, you are down to your malaria. So if you talk about corruption, you will have with you right now under this roof where it is coming from. And nothing will change, no matter how much you shout, until it's uprooted. As it is with corruption, so it is with the killings you see in the Middle West and elsewhere, so it is with the infrastructural decay that you see whereby there are no rules, no, nothing seems to be working anywhere. What we've done in the last 20 years, you know, to probe into, because I ended up uh, from the law, 
I had my beat uh, in court, and I ended up in the oil industry. But I left the oil industry in 1998 on account of this. Upstream, I left from senior executive uh, position in the upstream. There's nobody left in NNPC today who can argue with me for 10 minutes on national television on what it costs to produce crude, either on land, in the swamp, in the sea, on the desert. I've dealt with from, from what you call seismic studies, where you are looking for where you could find, to all of what you do in well development, to what you do in piping it around and processing it until the time you transport it and sell. But why did I leave? Because I came face to face with the document by which Shell and Mobile, Egypt, Earth were operating. And I said to myself, what could this mean? Does it mean we're not the owners of this land that these foreigners will dictate the terms by which they operate? I'm sure you've seen uh, the assigned posts, uh, those of you who came from Port Harcourt area. NMPC Shell Joint Venture, Shell Operator, Earth. Anyone you see, the operator is foreign. You have a business, a joint venture. You are not to know what it costs to produce whatever it is that joint venture has to do. It is that foreigner who will write down whatever he writes down, and whatever he declares as profit is what you now share. So I began to ask myself, how did we get to that? And it's not a two-year contract, it was a 50-year lease. Signed off between 1967 and 1969 by people who could not even read properly what was written under circumstances uh, in which they just signed first and it was explained to them later. How did, how did we even arrive at that point in 1967? We began to probe. It came to where I had to leave everything else to say let's, let's, let's even, we've, we've, because we found out there was not, nothing to be found in our archives. We asked some of our elders, people with gray hair, people who went to negotiate the independence for Nigeria. I happen to have spent uh, plenty of time with uh, the last of them who were alive uh, in course of the last 20 years at least. Enohoro, for instance, spent the last seven years of his life trying to undo what they did in going to sign us up into this union. We shouldn't have been. But first things first, the research from the known to the unknown led us to where we had to go to. You know the way WikiLeaks gets its, own info, gets its information? We had to get the information we were looking for by all means. We broke into the British archives using all our available technologies. And by the time we saw what was in black and white, some of them with instructions that they should not be typed. Because any day the wrong eyes see them, the whole edifice will come crashing down. Those documents are inside this room now. And we traced things from that way back to what became 1914. And from that 1914, before 1914, when we landed in 1900, when, I'm sure some of you must have, uh, might have heard about the uh, Royal Niger Company, yeah. Yeah. that the British had to pay 865,000 pounds to take over the trading areas in what they consolidated in readiness for the annexation of Southern uh, Protectorate with the Northern Protectorate. That question of paying 865,000 pounds at that time, somebody bought something from somewhere, and that person is still the owner of that piece of estate. 
Now your country, uh, okay, take me to the map, uh, no, not that. The, the ones in black and white, the one of uh, 19, uh, 1912, the ones in black and white. Scroll down, you'll see. But let's go on until they get there. The Nigeria you have, yes, hold it there. The Nigeria you have is a joint venture. You saw Prince Charles the other day, and he came. You saw the sitting arrangements. We have not moved from where we were, as at that time they created the union. It was a business venture. It was the trade of the era to go to wherever you can, beat them down, take whatever you can. So the British, the French, everybody was doing their own everywhere. But what became Nigeria was where the British had come towards this axis. And they managed to make their first landings. I'm sure you know about the, the Lagos colony of 1861, how Kosoko and Dosumo, you know, uh, <laughs> you know the, like that, the oil rivers. They came from the Atlantic waterfront, entered into trade treaties and protection treaties with some of those uh, trading partners in little bits and patches. Those treaties, dating back to the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and all of that, was what the British had in their hands at the time they were pushing northwards because on all the other sides, where will I even, uh, let me go closer so you can see. I uh, know it's, it's clear enough, they have a, you can, use, you can use the flyer you have in your hand, uh, the one that is broken, don't mind the, the fact that it's broken, the flyer has that map. This is Atlantic, you see Lagos there, you see, Port Harcourt here. This is the Atlantic waterfront. This British came. You can see that they, apart from River Niger, the map is divided into two sides. The British entered from this side, and uh, all the parts in that lower part were already in their hands at the time. On the other side, I'm sure you all remember the jihad, which we still have. You remember that they, they were foreigners too who invaded, landed in Sokoto, 1804, and conquered the portion in green, the portion in green in your map. They overran them. 1804, the British came in the 1860s. That means they were here 60 years before the British got here. Now, having secured that portion that you see in green, they were pushing downwards. They also wanted to get to the Atlantic waterfront. The British wanted to get to what was left on the east. On the eastern side is Cameroon. On the other, the northeastern side is uh, Chad. Then Niger. And then Benin Republic to the left. The French had already taken all of the other places. The British would have pushed all the way to here if not for that caliphate that was already occupying here and pushing downwards. They met halfway in a fight that happened in the Ilori benue axis. Caliphate coming to the ocean, the British trying to secure the balance of, of the land. After a short while, it occurred to them, ah, we're on the same mission, oh boy. Two robbery gangs after the same target. Say, why do we fight ourselves? Why don't you bring what you have? I bring what I have. We consolidate it so that we can share the benefits of having it permanently. And that was what became the amalgamation of 1914. Every document that transpired between them is in our possession, lodged in libraries across the world. Whatever they choose to do is already too late to be able to reverse the actions that have been initiated to salvage ourselves from what they've landed, in, uh, landed us into. Now, having reached 
that agreement. I'm sure some of us recall when the caliphate was talking about uh, dipping their Quran into the Atlantic Ocean. That is, they were telling the British at the time this matter of Nigeria because they were, they weren't, it, was, it was for them a matter of conquest. That is, they had to conquer. But the British came with something else. They said, well, whenever you guys are done with whatever you came to do, we'll push on until we dip our Quran into the Atlantic Ocean. Anybody here ever heard about that? Yes. Wonderful. Now, the document of the amalgamation was one in which, I'm sure, who are, the, who are the ones from South Africa here? Good. The apartheid, what the Boers did in South Africa was exactly what the, the, the Fulani did with their British friends over our heads here to make this place their own over the heads of the owners of all the lands. A master-servant relationship. And the instrument of 1914, uh, technical people, go back to what you first brought, the one in red, the one of 1913, so they can all read with us how, uh, yes, I can see it from here, but uh, the flyer you have, the one that has the map, uh, let's see so that we can be on the same page. Yes, if you have the flyer, read from the flyer, otherwise you can read from the screen. This was, this, uh, this is an excerpt from a, uh, a telegram from the secretary for the colonies explaining what they were about to do because they didn't tell anybody in southern Nigeria that they were going to lump us together with the people of the north. The discussion was strictly between them and that caliphate. It was a German newspaper that leaked it for the first time on the 26th of December in 1913. It took almost 15 years of day and night exchanges, meetings, travels, to piece, it, piece together all those parcels of land that came under those treaties. We, they, they, they didn't tell them where it was all going. Everybody thought they were still, the Shekiri thought they were still in their treaty. The Lagos colony thought they were still in their treaty. Everybody, the British, was tiptoeing over their head, you know, merging them. It was in 1906 that they merged the entire southern territories to become the protectorate of southern Nigeria. From that 1906, they then began to merge the systems to mortally opposed civilizations because on the other side, Sharia was already in place. You know, they came as jihad. How do, you, how do you create one political union with a group that owes it a duty of faith to kill the infidel? That duty never changes. No matter how you settle all the other things, the duty will never go away. You are the infidel, you have to be killed. They have a right in that their faith to lie to you. They call it takia. They deceive you into thinking you are in another business until you get killed. And they are also of a feudalist worldview. You know what feudalism is? All men are not born equal. No matter what you do, what you achieve, you are no more than the slave you are to them, even if they have no, nothing or no education. Between the two, a terrible alchemy that as a slave, you dare not compete with your master for the ownership or control of whatever. The slave does not have a right to anything, no right to property, not even right to life. You know you can do away with your slave, kill your slave. And that was the civilization that was already in place and the British knew, but they were also uh, they too were, uh, what do we call them, uh, they, they were feudalists too. And one thing led to the other. Eventually, they were able to piece it all together. That, that 
I'm now reading from that cablegram. Secretary of State, Secretary for the Colonies, uh, his name was uh, uh, Harcourt, the one after which uh, Port Harcourt was named. He says, in explaining what was about to happen the, the day before it did come public, that we have released northern Nigeria from the leading strings of the Treasury. The promising and well-conducted youth is now on an allowance of his own and is about to effect an alliance with the southern lady of means. I have issued the special license and Sir Frederick Lugard will perform the ceremony. May the union be fruitful and the couple constant. Secretary for the Colonies, Lord Harcourt, boss of Lord Frederick Lugard, referring to the import and purport of the annexation of the then Protectorate of Southern Nigeria to the Protectorate of Northern Nigeria. So what they, they, what they reported to you as amalgamation, as if there was some coming together of equals, was actually an annexation. And the, the purpose, what the British came to do, back to that map, please. Back to the map where... What the British came in search of were all on this axis. But the people they met here provided resistance. You know what they call resistance? They fought and fought and fought to make a landing. I'm sure there are Yoruba people here. I'm sure some of you have heard about uh, had a, a, your song many, many times. If I begin it, will you be able to join me to end it? It begins, hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, bantawa, ton figo, lun sere, awa ole, son wo ni bode, o de le. The clause I want you to take from it, awa ole, son wo ni bode, o de le. Your great grandfathers fought the British for years and years, preventing them from landing. And the, your song you sang now was the victory song composed. We will never pay custom duty to these foreigners on our waters. Today, 58 years into your independence, you are paying that customs religiously to people from this part. And from independence to date, not one of you had ever qualified to be Controller General of Customs. Now, I can give you up to 20 of these kind of examples. Who has ever been to Lagos Island, uh, the, the Victoria Island here? Does anybody know where Bonnie Camp is? Yes. Does anybody know where Eco Hotel is? Yes. The road that goes from the front of Bonnie Camp to Eco Hotel, what's the name of that road? Amadubelo Way. When you stand on Amadubelo Way, is there any other thing to do to go to the ocean? You are on the last firm piece of land before the Atlantic. Have they not dipped their Quran into the Atlantic? Who collects the rent? The landlord or, the, or, the, or whoever. It's not the landlord that collects the rent. They take away over two trillion from these port operations every year. I had, I won't call it misfortune. It so happened that a few months after Tinubu handed over to Fashola, we were at an event. He sat next to me. He was, speak. he was to speak before me. He finished, and I took over the microphone, and I asked him, said, Governor Emeritus, in the eight years you were governor here, what was the maximum sum you got from federal location? He was quick to remember. There was 73 billion Naira. I had documents with me in that event showing that in all those eight years, Nigeria did not take away anything less than 1.6 trillion as from port operation alone. 10% of 1.6 trillion is 160 billion. 
5% therefore, 80 billion. Lagos getting 73 billion in the maximum meant that Lagos in those eight years did not get even 5% of what Nigeria was taking away from their place. The event collapsed. That's, it, was, it was a blue roof in Ikeja here. The event collapsed when, you know, amidst all that noise, because I had come to tell them what we were doing, that if we do not act together to recover this land, you are not only going to remain the slaves you have been since that time, they will kill you and take your land and become the new owners to eliminate future claims. At the time this were, the, these things were happening, we had also, in, in this project, we had also gone around the country whispering at that time to the other people who were in the same danger. Nobody will listen. Back to how the, we've arrived at 1914. Therefore, Nigeria was, uh, as at that time, intended to be a marriage between the northern and the southern lady of means. I'm sure you hear about the uh, oil industry, a jaw, uh, blah, blah, blah. Who has been to Owere here before? Does anybody know where they call Shell Camp in Owere? Is there anybody here who has ever heard about Shell Camp in Owere? There's a place called Shell Camp. I'm sure you do not know that Shell was headquartered in that place for 42 years, going to Port Harcourt in 1960. And it's not a small facility. You know the Modotel Hotel that has become Rockview? That's the gate area. Government house Owere, the whole of that government house, was inside that facility. Avaniko Kudi University was inside that facility. The Federal Medical Center after the university was inside that facility. That's on one side of the road. On the other side, the whole of that mobile police camp, all the way to back of prison. These, all these listed were fenced together as the headquarters of Shell for those 42 years. They went to Port Harcourt in 1960 and M.I. Okbara as Premier of Eastern Region bought that property, then where it was a provincial capital. Why did they go to Port Harcourt? Because the pretense that they were dealing with uh, some Niger Delta, some, some, some people that uh, could not be properly described. They just wanted to create a woolly condition around that discussion because the Igbo fought them. Or very well, the Oba in Benin, you know how it ended. The King Jaja of Obobo, the one they had to send on exile, who migrated by himself from uh, Amiibo, next to Nkwere. That's where he came from. Now, what was going on? I'm sure you know uh, Rumo Mashi and uh, Rumo this and that and that. That was when, and why did they do that? They had sold your oil, uh, oil, for 50 years before they declared Oloibri. All the story you hear about Oloibri falls. This oil was used in the First World War, in the Second World War. Undeclared. It was property of the, uh, it was, Nigeria was their colony, was their, pro, was their property. So you didn't, you, you couldn't go quarreling with them for whatever they did. But in pretending that it was not so, clearing out the history books, I had, I've, had, I've had the misfortune of meeting with governors from the place and senators who did not know that this was the case. They believed the library with all their heart 
until I confronted them with the documents in our possession. And they went cold, ashamed because they, are, they were gray-haired men who were supposed to be telling their grandchildren. They did not know. And this pretense, you remember Willings Commission, 1957-58? Willings Commission did not deal with only the Niger Delta. It was minorities. I'm going to bring out three things from there so that we can move on to how we landed on the constitution we have on the table now and what we could do to wriggle out of it. Except we want to submit to be killed because that's what is coming our way. If we don't do something to stop them, what they are doing right now is what ISIS set out to do with Syria and Iraq. ISIS operated from the flanks. They are operating from the government house of Nigeria. When you hear Danjuma come out to shout that is ethnic cleansing, you think Danjuma was joking? Ethnic cleansing means so that there will be no future claim. They wipe you out, resettle their own people there. If you come in two years or three years, you won't believe anybody else was there before. Go and find out what has happened in Southern Kaduna. Not only do they dislocate and dislodge, eliminate and dislodge full, whole communities, they bring their own people from Mali. You remember when El Rufai talked about going to settle those who are killing his own people in 14 different countries? So, as you find these tiles on the ground here, these tiles you see, that's how they have mapped out Nigeria to the Atlantic waterfront. And they're taking it in. They are done with, uh, they are done with the green part, you see. They are in this purple belt, the one you call the middle belt. And the mission is to do away with them. Some of them have been renamed Emirates already. Is that not the case? Now, the, so that we can keep the trajectory, the next thing you find on that, uh, in 19, when independence you know, uh, was coming, and the independence didn't fall from the sky, the independence was where people from that southern part began to resist them, to say, look, you can't continue to govern us here. All of those who fought them. Can you remember anybody from the north who was part of the fight? Enohoro, Mokugo Koye, Awolowo, Usita Aguna. Name them. They were all from the south. And these guys now, the British now decided to. Independence, yes, you will get. But your situation will be worse than it was when we were here. And what they packaged as independence in 1960 was a bogus thing. Go back to the first map. Now, yes, wonderful. That's how I want it. You see this line here? This was northern Nigeria. This, this is southern Nigeria. Can you see the landmass? When independence was coming, they conducted a census. The whole of this place had 17% of Nigeria's population. 17%. The British, because of what they had in mind to create, a political structure that will make this one's permanent majority in all political decisions to be made in Nigeria. So that they can sit in Buckingham Palace and talk to Sokoto Palace and take whatever they want in Portacourt and Lagos without talking to any of you troublemakers. That's the whole purpose. And they've had it for a hundred years plus. And we're still here swearing to defend and uphold the constitution they imposed that make us slave. Imagine my brother from South Africa. Imagine in 1988 or even 85, that blacks living in South Africa, I'm sure you remember the Bantustan arrangement. The Boers, were, the Boers were able to convince some of the black people that, look, you can't do anything about we being here. 
why don't you just go one step at a time slowly? They say they will give them primary education up to maybe a standard three in the first instance. Then after so many years, they will go to standard six and then go. It may take about 50 years before they come to where they'll be qualified to go to any higher institution. And people bought into it. And they began to treat them. The discrimination was already there. They now began to give those people who agreed with them some little, little benefits. And they became those people who, who were working with them to go slowly became the biggest impediment on the way of the anti-apartheid fighters. I was in, I attended uh, Henry Oka's uh, trial. I addressed the judge in uh, Johannesburg uh, for two hours, 35 minutes. I had 53 cameras beaming live, TV cameras. CNN, Al Jazeera, all of them. And I told them the story of South Africa because the trial they had come to conduct was an attempt to replicate for Nigeria what was done in South Africa, to make master servant permanent. By the time we finished from court, the whole of South Africa was upside down. Young people who never heard about the story of their country in that manner trooped out to the streets on the side of what, because I challenged them with their own history. Was it by beheading Mandela and Oliver Tambo and Govan Becky that you solved apartheid? Why would you recommend that now that we find ourselves in the same situation? The only difference is that in South Africa it was the Boers. Here it's the Fulani. But the principle is the same. Foreign invader, minority, white, now owner of land, to the exclusion of owners of land. Willings Commission, if I go back to the map, settled a number of things. Back to the, in the oil uh, business. The reason Willings Commission asked that development be accelerated for them was because of that having sold this oil for this length of time, having degraded the environment that much, those people, when independence comes, will find out and they will begin to make trouble. The British were hoping that they would be able to whisper to them to say, don't you see, you have this, you have that, when others don't have. Relax. They would then accommodate, admit them into, in some way. That was the plan. But the people they handed over to in 1960 didn't do anything. When did Isaac Boro arise? Was it not six years down the road that they declared Niger Delta Republic from the same disputations that have now brought about MEND and the Avenger? Was it any different? They didn't keep that. The other part, who is from the Middle Belt here? The killings that are going on in the place. If you, if you look at this north now, it hasn't changed. These boundaries you see here have not changed. That north that, be, that begins from here, this is about Gakem area, to Meduguri and Sokoto there. The portion in green, these 12 states that pass Sharia, the other day officially. The balance, the one in purple, was where Amadou Bello wanted Sharia for the northern region, going into independence. That's when the British go away, it will be Sharia for his region. The other people, Joseph Taka and all the ones from the Middle West, say, no, our people <laughs> are not uh, Muslims and we can't be part of a, one region if Sharia will be uh, in place. They had to find common ground because they wanted a Middle West region. They fought and fought. They were being put down. The British settled it this way. They removed Sharia from the table and brought what they called penal code, so that those who are Christians can function freely uninhibited in that. And that was the condition upon which the Middle Belt became part of northern region of Nigeria. Therefore, from the day in year 2000, that those 12 states, the, the portion in green in your map, from the day in year 2000, that those 12 states simultaneously imposed Sharia in their contiguous territory. 
they had moved away from that foundational agreement, they have seceded from the Union of Nigeria. They have seceded from the secular Federation of Nigeria. Having so seceded, they reinforce, they are now coming to overrun the rest of the place. And why do they have to resort to that? The constitutional instruments they put in place, including the one the British helped them to put in place since 1914 to 1922 to 1946. I'm sure you heard about McPherson and the Littleton, all the way to independence. That became 63, which collapsed in 66. I'm now landing in the one that is uh, on the table. And what we must do, which if we don't do, we will pay in blood. If we don't do, we will pay in blood. It doesn't matter what the noise elsewhere is. When it came for the British to go, and they were asking those uh, territories they had governed for over 70 years at the time, how do you guys uh, continue when we go? They had governed them as three different countries. Nobody knew what they were doing in the north. Nobody knew what they were doing in the east or in the west. Gradually, the meetings that began to bring them together started happening towards the 50s. By the time we came to 53, Enohoro moved the motion for independence because they thought they had come to where they could become independent. Somebody, the northern uh, 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 delegates opposed it and defeated it. What was their reason? They said, oh, we cannot uh, go from British <laughs> colonialism that we're backward. We're not uh, yet in a position to compete with you. So if we go to independence now, the British will uh, step away, you step into their shoes, then we remain where we are. We, you can go your own. The British wanted, they, the British didn't tell anybody why they wanted the Union to be. Remember that before then, Amadou Bello had had cause to raise, to lament that uh, this was the mistake of 1914, that Nigeria was a mistake of 1914. And uh, not long after, uh, no, uh, uh, Awolowo also had reason to say that this geographical expression, no, the ones who were building Nigeria did not believe in it up till that point. At what point did it now become something that has become non-negotiable, sacrosanct, indivisible? Because they've managed to impose, you know, a constitutional models away from what was agreed. Because by the time they were getting ready, they had to be, uh, they had to make themselves constitutions as like you have Germany and France and Portugal going into European Union. All the negotiations of what they would do for themselves and what they will allow the European Union Authority to do for them. The federal government is supposed to be a union office for independent units. And that was how they came. Yes, that's how they came to where they became a one country to have accepted that level of autonomy. And it was Amadou Bello that made that demand. In all, by 1966, the five constitutions that defined the federation, the coup came, those constitutions were toppled. All those were talking about restructuring and how it will happen. Those constitutions that were toppled defined the federation of Nigeria. From the moment they were toppled, the federation of Nigeria ceased to be. The country was still in place. And a rogue federal government emerged. Elements who were in the government of that Nigeria that had died began to run riot, seizing the assets of all the federating units, which were contributing only 15% of their income, as they agreed, to, for the upkeep of the center. The center didn't own anything. So we came from being a federation into this unitarism. And by the time uh, they were going to hand over in 1979, they had found a way to also work out something that became a constitution that was not discussed. And it was that constitution that was not discussed in which they had created uh, all kinds of structures from the four regions they met uh, uh, that, were on, on ground, that were on ground in 1966. We have now 36 states created by decree. So a new majority has emerged. Each of the states has three senators at the place. So, uh, Some of the four local government areas in which Kano alone has 44. And Lagos that, that, uh, that uh, <coughs> had uh, 
the same 20 local governments with them at the beginning is still keeping 20, whereas uh, Kano has been broken into Kano and Jigawa. Between the two of them, they have 71 local government areas. What are they bringing to the treasury? Nothing. All the money Nigeria has to spend is between the oil money, the port money, and the VAT that is raised here. These people who bring nothing take 72% as of right in the place of sharing. And they're the ones who decide what other people will get, who they give more, who they give less. And in all of this, democracy, some of, one of, the, let me just uh, 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 refer to the documents you have in your, in one of the documents you see where we try to define democracy, that we do not have a democracy because democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. In those three, de in those three legs of definition, government of the people means that you, in exercise of your right to, so the, your sovereign right, decide the supreme laws of the land. The constitution we have on the table today did not come from that process. And so we do not, we have not decided how we, whether we will live together or how we will live. The second leg is of the people, meaning that only your vote can send people to government house. And when they get to government house, they can only function according to that constitution you already made. Do we have that? The third leg for the people, meaning that those who wield government powers must do so not only in accordance with what was put in place in the constitution, but for your benefit. The reason we don't have the, 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 the things that should have been coming to you as citizens is that you have not written the script of what should happen. And so you have in this constitution provisions that exclude responsibility towards you. Section 6, subsection 6C of your constitution absolves government of all responsibilities towards you. They don't owe you any school. They don't owe you any hospital. They don't owe you anything. Anything they do, they are doing out of the milk of human kindness. That is one. You have appropriation provisions. Section 81, section 82 hands over the keys to the treasury to the president. Section 121, 122 hands over the keys to the treasury to the governors. So they don't owe you any obligation. They have the spare key to the treasury. They have immunity in section 308. At what point are you going to get anything from them? How did you come about that constitution? By imposition. And what all the cry and demand for repairing this place goes to is to say, let us accept we have departed from the foundation of being a federation. Because if we were a federation, Lagos port would belong to Lagos. Oil and gas of Niger Delta would belong to them. The middle belt, where killings are going on unabated, unchallenged, will have the right to defend themselves because they will have guns. The constitution has 68 items on the exclusive list, all written by decree, that make it impossible for the middle belt to touch any gun. You saw where the governors went crying, and the president said, go home and live in peace with your Fulani ben of Benin. If we do not remove that from that constitution, nothing will resolve that question. As it is for that, those killings, so it is for electricity. I cannot generate electricity because it's on the exclusive list. Lagos has 40 million people. It cannot generate electricity. Imagine the day comes that California cannot generate electricity and have to wait for Maine to come and give them electricity. They will leave the union. Imagine the day that Texas is no longer in control of its oil fields. Would they remain in the union for 25 hours? And it's supposed to be a federation. What is a federation? So we have now, we are in a fraud now in which the federation that collapsed is being sustained by brigandage and they have imposed a constitution that we can no longer question. And anybody who says, what are you doing? What was Abiola's offense? Do you know why Abiola was killed? The servant does not rule over his master. So it's not, it's not only Jonathan that had to be chased away because he wasn't one of those who could preside. These same people are doing the killings in the Middle Belt, doing the killings in the East, doing the killings in the West. They are the ones who seize everybody's asset. They are the ones who impose this constitution. And you join them to go to elections under that constitution. By what constitution would they govern? Anybody who wins in this election, by what constitution is he going to govern? You are reinforcing your enslavement. And if they kill you in the process, it's your ignorance that killed you. 
we've been going all over the place trying to tell people that this is what is the case. They are not listening. We went to the men of God in the land. Without exception. Quietly. Sir, here's the problem. If Desmond Tutu did not join Mandela in South Africa, would you not still be in apartheid now? We are all men of God. If not for people like this, who say, look, enough of this thing being said in quiet places. There's nothing I've said there that I've not said on national TV, television. There's nothing I've said there that I've not said to the faces of those who have been governing Nigeria with this illicit decree. They are committing treason against the rest of us. They are committing treason against the rest of us. Because they put our signature on the document that sees our assets, that sees our lives. And we say, we have tolerated this document for 20 years, since 1999. We will not tolerate it any further. All of you, by the time they finish the election, less than 1,500 people will be sworn in as the ones who have won in the election. 180 million people are in danger. And they have managed to get you to come be on one side or the other. Put your mind the day after the election. The people who win will have to swear to defend and uphold your enslavement. The summary of what we are telling our people now is that processes had been undertaken. The majority, the whole of the South and the Middle Belt have been told and shown what the problem is. That constitution must go down. Those who are going to contest under it are doing so for their intestines, not on your behalf, whatever they say. If you do not wake up and go to what will work for you, you are not only going to remain in your situation, they will come to where they turn up at your doorstep with their AK-47 on their mission to conquer. Let us leave it there.